Welcome back, around to theCUBE here in the Palo Alto studio for the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leader Series. I'm John Furrier, the host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, my co-host, part of theCUBE and the NYSE Wired community coming together. We have here Charlie Giancano, who's the CEO of Pure Storage. Charlie, great to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Well, thank Let's you for it. having me. This is a real pleasure. Yeah. It's good seeing you guys. So again. great to have uh, all the leaders in Silicon Valley come through today and talk about where they see the action. Yep. And, you know, obviously a lot of companies are working on something. You guys had great success in, in the, on the business results um, with Pure Storage, but there's a bigger thing going on. Yeah. And you have a history, you've seen these ways before. We're kind of at a special inflection point. It feels like all the forces are, are coming together, compute networking storage, in a whole nother way. Right. Could you share your thoughts on how you see that? Because again, you've seen the 90s and we've seen those waves we talked about earlier. Yeah. What's your yeah. Well, you know, uh, hardware and systems are cool again, right? Uh, we've gone back uh, from, you know, very high level applications with lots of words and sound bites, but down to, as you put it earlier when we were talking, you know, feeds and speeds and, yeah. and uh, you know, how do we uh, squeeze more performance and more energy, uh, more capabilities out of the systems that we're putting in place and save people uh, time and effort. Of course, a lot of this is being driven by uh, the excitement around AI, right? Uh, but also the, the recognition that the amount of, uh, uh, that what's going on in data centers, uh, what's going on in the world of compute is really accelerating at this point and creating just you know, a lot of opportunity for uh, productivity for businesses and for, and for people alike. So you know, what we're seeing in the, AI, in the AI space is that it's opening up you know, multiple layers of opportunity. Uh, one is in the entire machine learning environment, the training environment. That's what's written about mostly in the press. Um, it's, it's exciting, it's big, drives uh, big valuations for, uh, for a lot of companies. But I think you know, in, in our world, that's going to be secondary to what enterprises do with uh, mm -hmm. AI and how they use it for infer what's called inference and retrieval yeah. augmented uh, generation. Uh, and then finally, use of AI just to make our own products uh, simpler and more effective for our, for our customers. You know, Charlie, I remember in 2018, we were in Bill Graham. Yep, and I took I my do. tie, had a t-shirt underneath. And, uh, and, and, but back then the pendulum was obviously swinging to the cloud. You're extending yeah. your stack to the cloud and bringing you know, innovation. Because uh, as we talk about all the time, you know, cloud does a lot of great things, but they don't do one thing like storage, for, right. example, for example, better than anybody. That's what you guys do. Is the pendulum swinging back now? What's the, what's the balance look like? And, and, and what are you seeing in the customer base specific as to what you were just talking about as far as data and AI? Right. Well, you know, last decade, the view was everything was moving to the cloud and eventually it would just be cloud. This decade, it's very, very clear to everybody and to the enterprises that it's going to be a hybrid environment. Some things the cloud does very well at and, and enterprises are going to move some of their workloads there. There are some things that they can't trust the cloud for. Uh, they can't trust it from the standpoint of cost or of performance or of security and a variety of other things. So there's going to be a lot of things that stay on-prem. Uh, on but what everybody wants Everybody wants to act like the cloud. They want to be, be able to have their environment behave like the cloud. So a lot of the challenge for, um, uh, for companies that supply uh, uh, enterprises is how do we make their environment, their data centers operate more like the cloud and be transparent to the cloud. And that's what, that's what we're doing at Pure. We're, making our, we're enabling it so that our software works both on-prem and in the cloud and that it's transparent to the customer as, as to how they operate. We've had some interesting conversations over the years, you and I. I, I want to ask you <laughs> a, a Charlie question. Is the, is the cloud, in your opinion, inherently more costly, or is it just the business model has an umbrella for, for pricing that you think they now have to stick with? Right, well, you, you can't separate the cloud itself from the business model that supports the cloud, right? And I, what I would say is any large organization has the economics to be able to operate at lower costs than the cloud. And the question might be, do they want to? And can they? <laughs> uh, or, and, do, and do they have the talent to do so? Okay. But I would say for mid-sized business, the cloud is going to be, is going to be less expensive. Mm -hmm. For any, any large-scale enterprise business, Global 2000, then it's going to be, well, where, how do they want to balance it? Because the economics for production workloads is very expensive in the cloud. And that's interesting, and I want to, if you don't mind following up on that, because 
one of the things with hybrid cloud, when people went cloud and then back on premise for cloud operations, as you yeah. pointed out, yeah. they start to see end-to-end -end workload. Yes. And then all the top Gen AI successes we're seeing today is end-to-end -end scoped. Right, Okay, right. so from a system standpoint, then Gen AI with the data is handled differently. Right. Do you agree with that? And if so, or how would you correct that? Or what does that mean? So the, one of the, there are many challenges still with AI in terms of its use every day by business. Mm -hmm. uh, one of which is uh, you know, data security, role-based access controls, which there's not a good answer for right now. So uh, a lot of companies, rightfully so, are retaining their own data and being very, very careful yeah. with what they allow, um, especially cloud-based models, but frankly, any model to be able to get access to. Now, those problems will probably be solved in the, in the or solved, they'll be increasingly solved in the next two or, uh, two or three years, but those are big problems now. And I think that's going to hold back, it's going to hold enterprises back from sharing that information and keeping it, they want to keep it on-prem. I just wrote a research piece around, um, called Next Generation Infrastructure for Generative AI Clustered Systems. I kind of made up that term to kind of give, think of the new data center as a bunch of systems, not just racks, right, which right. I think is the way to go. But it, part one of this piece was storage and networking for Gen AI. I want to get your thoughts on my storage. The read write intensity changes based upon things. So pre-processing read write intensity is high. Right. Training, a lot of reading. Train, well no, and a lot of, uh, or, that, or, that is the view. That, that is the, Okay, correct me, yes, that's yeah, the real time but, iteration but, here. But writing is extraordinarily important, I'll tell you why. Okay. So, Take a large AI model, right? And you've heard this before. It may yeah. run days, may run weeks, right? What happens if a processor fails during that period of time? Uh, check, you got to start over. Error check. Start over. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't do that. People are smarter than that. So what they do is every uh, period of time, could be five minutes, mm -hmm. could be half an hour, they, what's called checkpoint. Yep. Yeah. They take all the data on, that's in memory of all the systems and they write it. And when they write it, they have to write it simultaneously, so they can't be working on the problem at the time. So all of that time is, is gone. And so what they want to do is write it as quickly as possible so they, they save as much time. They're as not possible. writing the spinning disk. No. So checkpointing is the writing phase. <laughs> checkpointing is the writing phase, and that checkpointing is massive. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot write at, at high speed, this is a place where we excel, so I'm very excited about it. If you can't write at very high speed, you just can't uh, uh, provide, those systems are just not going to work. The bottlenecks, would, uh, they'd be serious bottlenecks. Serious bottlenecks in writing, right. Okay, good. Well, yeah. I got it right then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, RAG is popular, okay, but that's a search paradigm, that's a lot of data. Yeah. So storage is changing. So how would you, how do you, how do you see this storage? Because man, storage compute, the holy trinity, as we say, is out there. It's right. changing, Gen AI is fundamentally changing how it has to behave. Correct, that is absolutely right. How would you describe what the change is? Well, I think there are multiple changes. We just described one of them. Write speed, you know, becomes yeah. extraordinarily important on, on the training side. On the RAG side, let's talk about how old school AI or analytics has been done in the past. Mm -hmm. What you would do is you would take your data that is stored on your different production mm -hmm. systems and you would, what's called replicate it, or you would copy it mm -hmm. onto a dedicated system, typically called a data lake or a data warehouse. So that's more storage, all right? You took data that was perfectly good where it was, but you put it on a, you put it on a new system, cost you, mm -hmm. cost you more money. Uh, and typically it goes into a slow, cheap system and then you have yet another system that's a fast, expensive system that gets used on your AI uh, compute environment, <laughs> right? Seems like a lot of redundancy. A lot uh, of moving me, parts. Right? If you're going to be putting in inference in RAG, wouldn't you rather be working on real-time data that's sitting on the production environment, right? And be able to get access to it for uh, you know, retrieval augmented generation, which is simply that, I think I came up with an answer, but I want to check. To yeah. make, with real data to make sure that it, I'm not just hallucinating, yeah. right? That, th that's really what it is. And why should you have to replicate and have twice the amount of storage or three times the amount of storage to be able to do that and then it's old data? We're creating an environment where, where uh, on our arrays, all of that data appears as a pool of data. It's accessible by AI. So what AI wants is access to data. Now, you have to have the proper, of course, uh, security mechanisms in there, role-based access controls but then you want to have it to have, you want to allow it to have access to the data where it sits yeah. instead of having to be able to replicate and, it. And, and that data will live, you don't really care where it is, you can participate in the cloud. And right, because you shouldn't care where it is. So, the, but the, but the so-called modern data stack, you know, defined by Snowflake and Databricks, uh, was 
predominantly cloud-based. Right. But you could participate in that. Right? Well, there, and th but, these days, you know, just because you're doing your processing in the cloud doesn't yeah. actually mean you need your data in the cloud. That's a good point. Well, but, but so ex explain how Great point. That, that might evolve with this, because most of the modern data stack activity was done right. in the cloud. Yes. And that's changing because of Gen AI, people don't want to put all their data in the cloud. Right. So how does that, how does that new, new, new modern data stack look right. to you? Well, first of all, you know, when people talk about um, you know, application stacks or full stack, they're thinking of a very physical situation. Yeah. It, they've got a physical storage array, a physical network switch, and a, and, yeah. and a set of, uh, of, of servers on top of that that are all working together in a stack. So it, you know, it's an old fashioned fixed environment, mm -hmm. right? That's not the way the cloud works. It's not the way that customers want to work. What they want is, yes, you have to build a stack, but they want it to be a virtual stack. And they want it federated. They, yeah. they want it federated. They want to be able to, first of all, they want it to be abstracted so that the developer just says, I need so much compute, I need so much networking uh, configured a certain way, I need so much storage yes. of a certain set of characteristics. And you know, with a little bit of typing and, and code, yeah. automatically it appears. Now, from a physical standpoint, you know, that'll be different servers in different places, different storage, who knows where, um, you know, and the network, which is you know, a flat network that yeah. can be configured. Um, that's really what they want, but that's when people talk about full stack today, they're thinking physically. Yeah, yeah. So even developers is changing the notion of what full stack that, is. That's but, a, but on exactly. both sides. But keep going because the modern modern data stack so is going to be federated. It'll be so the the network has been flat since the '90s. We'll yeah. go back to the '90s. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, it's yeah. an IP network, yeah. and and there are lots of different protocols to create virtualization. Um, uh, compute has been virtualized since the let's say almost two decades now, sure. we're starting with the VMs, mm -hmm. right? Virtual machines, and now with containers and Kubernetes, even more exciting, yeah. more virtualized, more dynamic, right? Yeah. Storage has never been virtualized before. This is what we're doing with something we call Fusion, that again allows, instead of it being a dedicated array, now it just looks like a yeah. pool of storage. Yes. It looks like a cloud of storage. Easy to work and with. so uh, the, the computer, the application has an API, it writes to the API, it gets written somewhere, uh, based on policies, yeah. uh, and the the developer doesn't have to worry about where it might be. Because when you say storage has never been virtualized, you mean outside of the single sort of physical box. Of, outside of the in physical a, in a box. data center. That's right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Spanning that physical. Well, well to, to be more accurate, yeah. within a um, uh, within a hyperscaler, they have virtualized the storage that yeah. they provide to their customers. Right. But inside of enterprise, it's never really been done. You know, it's interesting. You know, we've covered storage for 15 years of the cube. Um, and then we've been covered pure since the launch, I think when they launched in, years ago. Yeah, ten, and then 10 we, years ago. 10 years ago, and then you accelerate, we covered yeah. your events. Thank you. The evolution of storage just gets better. Flash changed the game, continued. Right. And even just as we see, you're not a storage company. We're a software You're a systems company. company. Systems company. And right. everything you're talking about is just the data needs to be somewhere. Exactly. I mean, you're going to make a pool that's invisible to the developer, but abstract it away, that's value. We actually want to make the hardware disappear. I mean, at the end of the day, everything, at, at the end of the day, everything is yeah. hardware. It's got to run on something. It's got to run on something. So this modern layer is just, okay, data is going to look like a developer platform. Right. It's going to be available, horizontally scalable. Governance built in, right. catalog open. Correct, it's going to be defined by IT to fit whatever their compliance or, uh, or uh, corporate um, uh, directives are. And then the developers then just get to choose what version of Well, you guys got a great tailwind on your business. So AI is pushing you guys hard into, into the development. You got a partnership with NVIDIA. Yeah. How's it going with your customers? Can you share some of the deployments because um, enterprises are taking baby steps, but they're moving as fast as they can. Yep. They recognize data as the intellectual property. Right. They're not just going to give it to the LLMs. Private AI is hot right now. Right. Sovereign, sovereign AI, whatever we want to call it, all going to be developed on premise. Yeah. Well, we have great examples of all three of those uh, um, AI type environments I spoke mm -hmm. about. Uh, one is the, the large scale, you know, whether it's um, uh, LLMs or machine learning environments, you know, Meta yeah. for a long time has been a long time customer in their AI environments. Still, I think the largest in the world is the Meta Research uh, Supercluster. I think it's 24,000 uh, GPUs. We have a half an exabyte of storage in that environment. And you're in that with NVIDIA. Uh, we are, NVIDIA's the, uh, yeah. Other one in there, it, I think they're in yes, there. Yes, correct. Too. NVIDIA is the, uh, is the GPU uh, that's in there. Uh, as well as- huge uh, deployment. Yeah, absolutely. Then uh, you know we uh, are also partnered with NVIDIA in terms of uh, RAG and inference designs with uh, uh, you know vertically um, oriented RAG designs for when I say vertical I mean for like um, 
uh, domain specific uh, data. Domain specific, so uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, me uh, uh, medical technology, also uh, uh, finance, and so forth. I mean, the uh, vector vector indexes are providing yeah. massive performance on retrieval. Right. At scale, I mean, yes. it, it's unprecedented. I've never seen that before. Right. How fast are customers adopting in the verticals? Like, I'd almost see them just because neural networks have to be full. Right. <laughs> the, yes. The bigger the brain. Right. The better. You know, but it's different. It's different in different environments. In many of these environments, they they don't need massive amounts of GPUs, especially yeah. for parameter-based environments. What they're doing is they're putting LLMs. Uh, in front of parameter-based AI environments. Hmm. So a parameter-based environment is like reading pathology slides and coming up with a determination of whether or not there's cancer, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, you, you can do that, but if you need, an, if you need a, an expertise in programming to be able to get the answer, it's not as useful. If you put an LLM in front of it, then any pathologist or doctor can start asking questions yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and get answers uh, from it, right? So whether it's that or whether it's a training algorithm that's been on machine learning, a lot of these can be done with relatively few um, uh, GPUs. So, you, you know, the LLMs, of course, they're very famous for requiring so many. Yeah. They're, most parameter-based applications don't really require so much, and the LLMs are available yeah. as cloud-based services. Um, so, but, yeah. Go ahead, please, no, finish. finish well, the, the, third, the third area is where we're helping our customers uh, with uh, AI to be able to manage. As I mentioned, we're going from where, where uh, just the individual storage arrays are used, mm -hmm. right, and each one managed individually. Yeah. to where it now looks like a cloud of storage. Now, someone still needs to manage that cloud because at the end of the day, it is physical. Mm -hmm. And so by putting AI in front of our analytics tools, which are parameter based, but putting an LLM, now your, your storage administrator or your IT manager can ask general questions about the entire um, cloud of storage. And they can say, they can ask questions such as, you know, expecting our usual Christmas rush, do we have the performance necessary to be able to address that without failure. Or I'm starting to see some latency problems here. Can you di help me diagnose, uh, you know, uh, you know how I can uh, fix that? An another sort of pick Charlie's business model brain. In the 2010s, you had a number of independent storage companies that couldn't stay independent. Right. EMC, um, you know, Isilon obviously got acquired. A number of them either ran out of TAM or they couldn't get to go to market right. I mean, notwithstanding NetApp, I mean, um, you guys come out, you hit escape velocity and clearly thriving as an independent. What is it that allows you to thrive as an independent? Is, that, is it that software component, that, those marginal economics? What's the advantage of, of advantages of being independent? Yeah, well, I, I think really it's, it's based on, a, on several core um, technologies and, and sustainable competitive advantages mm -hmm. that we have that really no one else shares. And it's because we wrote our stack, we wrote our software fundamentally to work with raw flash. Our, our insight at the time, it takes me back to the 80s or 90s, the insight at the time being that internet protocol was going to take over the world. Well, flash, flash is going to take over storage. There's just no question about it. The days of hard disk are numbered. And our, insi our insight was, first of all, stick with that, stay with that. Don't yeah. try to write to hard disk because eventually they'll go away. But secondly, by by focusing on raw flash, we got several different advantages. One was by not using SSDs, which are simply a uh, SSD mimics hard disk. It's, it's a way to make flash look like a hard disk. Making a semiconductor look like a mechanical device usually is not the best <laughs> use for the, for the technology. Yeah. By focusing on flash, one is we, we had a more performant, less expensive uh, environment. Okay, so you know whether it's cost or price, we're at the for, or or, or performance, we're at the forefront of both of those sustainably. Mm -hmm. Okay, because everybody else uses SSDs because their software was written for hard disk. Secondly, because we have so much excess performance, mm -hmm. we're able to do things that others are simply not able to do. A couple of examples of that. You know, our data reduction is yeah. really better, much better than any, anything else out there, right? And th that allows us, again, to save customers money, uh, save power, space, and cooling. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that's the other advantage of, of writing to raw flash, power, space, cooling, where we're much less that's than everybody else. That's a huge advantage. A another, uh, you know, very big advantage is that we were able to create an evergreen model. So what does an evergreen mo model mean for us? 
year after year and now decade after decade, we can consistently make the, a sold product new uh, so that it never needs to be replaced. Um, uh, it is always new. So every few years we replace every single component in, in that product so that 10 years after we originally sold it to the customer, without the customer spending another dollar in capital, it looks like a product we had sold in within the last year. That's a nice refresh. It's a nice refresh, right? There's never- Because you're in an invisible pool. There's never a data migration. It looks like it yeah, looks you like you want to have service. the best product right. for the customer. Exactly right. Well, uh, you know, one of the things is it, with almost every piece of hardware, including storage, yeah. customers are used to getting about a five year life out of it and then basically throwing it okay. away it. and buying it all over again. But that's right. because they're buying your software. Correct. It, it, our, our, we call it our evergreen uh, forever yeah. support. Uh, you yeah, know, it's which smart. Yeah, it's a service. It's, it's, it's a, it's it's a, you want the best products all the time for the customer. Right. So let me ask you a question because this is interesting because things come and go. We've seen fashion, software defined, right. radios and, and wireless, software defined networking, software defined storage. I mean, what we're talking about here is if it's invisible, it's all it's automatically software defined. So Correct. what is the difference between the old definition of software defined storage and I guess generative AI, since it's generative, it's software defining because it's developers built. What's your thoughts on that? Because it's it, it seems like it's dead over there, but it's just reborn. So, you know, I went through this with software defined networking. So the first definition of software defined networking was that um, I'm going to take open source software, put it onto uh, generic hardware, yeah. and that's software defined. And then it, people pr uh, pretty much figured out is that has nothing to do with software defined. Software defined means that an engineer can define the way my networking works, okay, by with code. All right, it's not physically defined by the product. It's that a software engineer yeah. can affect the way the, that networking operates. Well, software defined storage, if you were to ask most customers today, they mean, oh, I can buy software from a vendor, put it on my hardware, and that's storage. And of course, it's still defined by the software that you bought yeah, and not software. by an engineer that can write a few lines of code and completely change the way the, um, uh, the storage works. So software defined so storage never existed. It never really existed. It was software and it was hardware. Software marketing defined. Exactly. So what we're doing is virtualizing storage by which I mean that the storage will behave in a way that is set by IP and defined by the way that a developer wants the storage to be able to operate. That's software defined storage and, it, yeah. and it's in a sense it's not, um, it doesn't depend on the hardware. The, the, nobody knows, yeah. other than the person managing the physical cloud, nobody else has to know wasn't how the that, hardware. Wasn't that kind of your premise for the, the Portworx acquisition is to try to change the way that people thought about storage and, and, and have you achieved that, that objective? Uh, that is also true, that is also the case. Yeah. Uh, whereas, and, and Portworx works with Kubernetes and containers, yeah. right? So container-based storage, a little bit different than everything else. So P Portworx gives us the ability to do that. But everything that we do is Kubernetes-based now. So the Fusion yeah. that I told you about, that abstracts storage, that's that's Kubernetes. Portworx is yeah. Kubernetes, so. And the great news there is Kubernetes is now stable. It's boring, right. which means it's like Linux, it's working. Exactly it's right. It's tight. So going back to software-defined, I always thought infrastructure as code, by the way, was yeah. like you just, Make infrastructure the infrastructure co code. code. Code the infrastructure, that's right. not DevOps and, right, right. and Terraform. That's right. Most people think that's what it that's is. That's management, that's, you know, yes. It's like, I want to define software in my application to form my infrastructure at will. Right, you want virtual stacks, you want virtual environments. How close are we there now? Are you happy where you're at? Where's the progress bar for yeah. full completion? Because Gen AI prerequisite is essentially foundationally has to have the data and the infrastructure perfectly teed up for this. Well, one of the things about Gen AI is you still need experts uh, yeah, the wor in order to make this all work. And of course, the, the history of technology, where <laughs> technology goes, is eventually you want it so that uh, you know your, your, your average, at least engineer, if not your average person on the street, can actually be, be able to use this. Um, it, where we are right now in the uh, virtualization of storage is we're right at the very beginning, right? Customers are still getting their heads around it. By the way, it took a while for customers to get their heads around yeah. virtualizing applications, right? So virtualizing storage, they're just getting their heads around it. I think get, uh, where we are relative to making AI outside of prompts, but yeah. uh, allowing AI to be um, really useful in a flexible way in a business environment for a wide variety of capabilities, we're still quite a few years away from that. 
Well, Charlie, great to have you on theCUBE. This is like a master class. Um, congratulations on the Pure success. What's, what's going on with Pure? Give the plug for Pure uh, storage. What's going on there? The results, projects. Yep. Technology, customers, give the update. Well, continued growth. Uh, you know, last last quarter we grew 18% year over year. Continue to take market share very significantly. We're now um, second, uh, the, the second highest market share in all flash storage. So, you know, continuing to grow. I expect to be the number one in all flash storage within the next couple of years. Uh, so, you know, that's been that's been great fun. Uh, one thing that uh, you know, I'm very, we're all very excited about is we actually expect that within the, this, uh, this year, we will see our first design win for replacing disks within a hyperscaler in their, in their customer facing uh, services. Yeah. So, you know, the, it's- Talking spinning disk. Yeah. I'm talking about spinning, well, 90% of, of the storage infrastructure in hyperscalers is spinning disk, 90%. Yeah. They use it for everything, right? And because it's, because it's been cheap, yeah. we're now at a parity uh, systems level price point <laughs> and we're one tenth of the space power and cooling. And what's at a premium right now in hyperscaler data centers? And cooling. Power. You know, Andy power Jassy's cooling. favorite quote, friends don't let friends build data centers. Now it's friends don't let friends use spinning disk and clusters. 100%, <laughs> yeah. Because what's that, there's downside. Well, first of all, you're replacing them all the time because yeah. they're failing uh, all the time. So they're, yeah. you know, they're expensive that way. But frankly, the downside is, well, there's no upside in disk anymore. That's, that's really the downside. Charlie, you're a legend in the industry. You're a leader in, in infrastructure, uh, many waves, and you're doing it pure. Thanks for being part of our inaugural Silicon Valley AI Leaders series. The community got a chock full of data there and masterclass. Well, congratulations to all of you on your Thank inaugural you. <laughs> uh, uh, show. So yeah, we appreciate it. Okay, Charles Palo is here, CEO of Pure Storage. This is Silicon Valley's AI Leaders program, part of theCUBE and NYC Wired. Thanks for watching.